Hi, it's Dwyer. It is May 18th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Well, a grenade has just gone off in the heavyweight division. An arbitrator has ruled in Deontay Wilder's favor, leading to a lot of uncertainty over the upcoming heavyweight title fight between his nemesis, Tyson Fury, and Anthony Joshua. Let's talk about it, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, the idea of Deontay Wilder taking step-aside money to allow the Anthony Joshua Tyson Fury fight to take place is perilous, right? Just strategically, fill in the boxes here. Understand that, according to reports, Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua have a two-fight deal. A two-fight deal. So if you're signing an agreement to step aside, how long are those two fights going to take? Right? Understand, whatever's going on between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury impacts Anthony Joshua. Joshua would have to be a signatory to the agreement, right? If I'm Deontay Wilder, I'd have to have my legal counsel go through any proposal with a fine-tooth comb because Deontay Wilder hasn't been in the ring for quite some time. And if he's supposed to wait another 18 months for Joshua and Fury to fight each other twice, keep in mind, this is boxing. Cuts happen that delay rematches. Things happen that delay rematches. Right? To me, stepping aside to allow a two-fight series between Fury and Joshua is asking too much. One man's opinion. Let me also find uh, let me also point out too that accepting step-aside money wouldn't compensate him for the money he'd make fighting Tyson Fury in a rematch, right? How much step-aside money do you think would be a fair amount? $5 million? $10 million? Folks, understand it's rumored that just off the fight fee, Fury and Joshua are each getting $75 million for their first fight against each other. If that's the price level, and keep in mind, you now have Triller out there, and Mike Tyson, for example, is supposed to have gotten more than $10 million for his fight against Roy Jones. Is it possible that in elite fights, and in my opinion, that's what a heavyweight title fight is, that the market value for a known fighter, champion or ex-champion, is now greater than $10 million? So if Deontay Wilder is going to be financially compensated for stepping aside, wouldn't that warrant him getting north of $10 million in step-aside money? But understand, getting step-aside money will do nothing to rehabilitate his image. Going into his fight against Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder was unbeaten. Unbeaten. There were those out there who thought he won the first fight, right? After all, they saw Tyson Fury knocked down twice. The idea, too, is that Tyson Fury took his time getting off the canvas in that 12th round. Did he beat the count? Should the referee have stopped the fight? So the only way 
that Deontay Wilder gets back the reputation he had, especially after the shellacking he took in the rematch. Let's remember that shellacking. He's dropped off a body shot. That fight ends when his corner quits. Right? They, they retire him. That's how bad it was. He's bleeding out of his ear. Tyson Fury looks unmarked. This isn't the Otto Wallen fight. Tyson Fury's unmarked. He's just won every round against Deontay Wilder. It was jarring at the time. The only way Deontay Wilder gets vindication is by getting in the ring against Tyson Fury to avenge the loss. You don't get that if you just get handed a check. So, from Deontay Wilder's perspective, and understand, whatever happens here, it's going to take two to tango. They're going to have to come to Deontay Wilder at some point in any negotiation and say, player, can we cut a deal? They're going to have to come to him. He's already won the legal proceeding. Right? At some point, they're going to come to him and he has to ask himself, hey, would I feel good about what's being offered here? I don't think Deontay Wilder is going to feel good about accepting step-aside money. I just don't. Let me tell you the stain step-aside money leaves historically. In the 1990s, we had two guys who actually fought each other in the Olympic Games. Then both became champion. Right? The guy who won the 1988 Olympic gold medal, Lennox Lewis. And the guy who becomes heavyweight champion, Riddick Bowe. At the time, Bowe held the belt, professional belt. Lennox Lewis accepted step-aside money to allow Bo to fight someone else. So just understand what that did to the argument of who's better, Riddick Bo or Lennox Lewis, right? Who was top dog during that time period? Well, even though Lennox Lewis went on to have a great career, there's always the idea that Lennox Lewis had an opportunity to fight Bo and took step-aside money. And understand too, I know it's not quickly apparent today, but Riddick Bo, at his best, had great skills, right? The argument would have been Bo was no longer who he was as an amateur, right? He had improved his game. He had Eddie Futch in his corner. Joe Fraser's cornerman from back in the day. Freddie Roach's cornerman. So here, Deontay Wilder has to think about where he is in history 15 years from now. Is he remembered as a guy who took step-aside money? So when we start arguing about his place in history versus his contemporaries, right? His place in history versus Tyson Fury. Are we going to have a definitive third fight, win, lose, or draw, where we can say, oh, well, here's what happened. Here's what happened in the ring. Understand, the way the games play out, Deontay Wilder only has to be right once, right? That first fight, Quite frankly, I didn't think he won any rounds other than the rounds in which he dropped Tyson Fury. Nonetheless, there is a Deontay Wilder argument. He was the one dropping Tyson Fury. Right? Tyson Fury, I believe, gets dropped in the ninth round, then the twelfth round. The argument was, hey, look, the latter part of the fight, Deontay Wilder started to assert himself. 
right? Wilder could get undressed in a third fight. Like the first fight, he only has to find Tyson Fury once if he drops Fury in a third fight and ends up losing. There'll be Wilder people who will say, hey, look, he dropped Fury in multiple fights. Right? Multiple fights. Can he get any such level of vindication if he takes step aside money? I think not. And of course, if he takes step aside money, there's no chance that he gets a win over Tyson Fury in a court-ordered match, which would, of course, return the luster to his star. Let's also talk boxing for a second. In my opinion, it's too dangerous for Deontay Wilder to fight a Dylan White. Let's be real here. Right? A guy who's been active. A guy who's on the top of his game. I think it's even perilous for him to fight, let's say, a heavyweight with not as big a name. Right? Effie Agaba, who hits as hard as anyone in the heavyweight division. Fans may not know him, but we do. Let's say Deontay Wilder signs to fight a fighter and then looks bad against him. He'll stand to lose far more than he would stand to gain by hopping in the ring prepared or unprepared against Tyson Fury in a third fight for big money. So I'm not sure. When marquee names are getting $75 million for heavyweight fights, I'm not sure if in this era Deontay Wilder can be properly compensated with step-aside money. Let's talk about the Anthony Joshua side of the ledger, because I believe Joshua also has problems. They're threatening to strip him. Understand, there's another guy who might need some step-aside money, Alexander Usyk, right? The problem with holding multiple titles, as Joshua does, is that you're dealing with multiple mandatory contenders. You're going to have to pick a time of day when you can fight someone like Tyson Fury where you don't get stripped for avoiding one of your mandatories. Now, think about what happens here. If Deontay Wilder says, player, I've already won in court. What leverage do you have in any negotiation with me? Tyson, fight me next. No, I'm not going to take $5 million or $10 million and then have you go up against Anthony Joshua for two matches. Or have the luster of our match get undercut by you struggling against Anthony Joshua, being awarded a questionable win, and then people aren't going to look at our fight the same way. So fight me or retire. Right? That's the strategy. That's the argument that the Deontay Wilder side of the aisle can make. Well, think about the Joshua side of the aisle. Fight fans will say, okay, look, we don't care if Joshua gets stripped by the sanctioning body that has Usyk as the mandatory if Joshua is fighting the lineal, the WBC champion, Tyson Fury, right? We'll, we'll shake our heads and we'll say, boxing, politics, this is ridiculous. But at the same time, we recognize that Tyson Fury is unbeaten, that Tyson Fury has beaten Vladimir Klitschko and has beaten Deontay Wilder. We understand his resume, his background, that he's credible. At heavyweight. Right? Not cruiser. No, no. We don't have to speculate or extrapolate on how, you know, wins at cruiser translate into wins at heavy. We know Tyson Fury's legitimate. So Anthony Joshua can do a Riddick bow. He can hold a press conference with a belt on his shoulder, say, look, I'm stripping this organization of my recognition 
take the belt off his shoulder, throw it in the garbage, and say, yeah, I'm fighting Tyson Fury next. We'll forgive him. But if Tyson Fury is not available, right? Let's say the arbitrator came down in favor of Deontay Wilder. So let's say Tyson Fury then says, hey, look, Anthony, I'd love to fight you. But I'm going to have to fight this man. We had a deal. Right? And fight fans know that Tyson Fury owes Deontay Wilder. Right? Because when Tyson Fury was in boxing Siberia, right, coming back from a layoff, out of shape and getting himself back together, fighting fighters we haven't heard from since, heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder gave him a shot. So there's some karma here, right? We understand, okay, well, Tyson Fury promised a rematch to Wilder to get that second fight. Okay, we get it. We're not going to abandon Tyson Fury because he's fighting. The guy he won the WBC title from. But Anthony Joshua, whoa, what happens next? Aren't fans going to say, hey, Joshua... To keep those belts, you're going to have to fight these mandatories. Understand, too, the way things work. Sanctioning bodies will look the other way. Some fighter says, hey, look, I need to fight this other guy next. And a sanctioning body will say, okay, well, you're going to take care of our mandatory. Right after you handle this business. Well, when this business doesn't happen and the calendar keeps changing dates... Right, the sanctioning body eventually is going to say, look, man, we got to stay credible with the public. <laughs> you got to fight our mandatory. So, Anthony Joshua against Alexander Usyk. I know many of you, many of you are going to say, oh, come on. Usyk didn't look that spectacular against Derek Chisora. Right, we'll overlook the fact that Joseph Parker didn't look that spectacular against Derek Chisora. In a fight Chisora had after fighting Usyk, right? Maybe Chisora is having a career renaissance. But my point to you is simply, do you think Anthony Joshua could move away from Usyk the way he moved away from an out-of-shape Andy Ruiz in their rematch? I don't think so. I think Usyk is the better athlete, has the faster foot speed. Well, let me ask a more foundational question. We know Derek Chisora is in his comfort zone as he's stepping on the gas, as he's tracking you down. We know that early in his fight against Joseph Parker, Chisora comes across the ring and drops Parker up against the ropes. That's seconds into that fight. Is Anthony Joshua the kind of guy who's going to come across the ring and threaten Usyk in the first few seconds of the first round? Hell, is he going to come across the ring and be front foot heavy in the first round against Usyk? Let's ask even a more difficult question. Is Usyk the kind of fighter who wants to be pursued? Just not pursued as heavily as Derek Chisora pursued him. Right? Understand, boxing is flooded with guys who look helpless, small. Right? Floyd Mayweather, who want you to come looking for them. So as you try to find them, you're getting hit with counters. You're walking into traps. You're getting bludgeoned. Isn't Usyk's style more made for Joshua than it was Derek Chisora? Understand, Chisora has a habit where he drops his head, and he throws these looping shots. Right? There's a misdirection play going on where his head is here, but you're seeing shots coming from over here, 
right? That's not Joshua's game, is it? Joshua's not a guy throwing punches at odd angles after hustling across the ring in the first few seconds of every round. So I get the feeling, and I know many of you disagree with me, but understand, Usyk fought one of the toughest fights he's going to have at heavyweight by fighting Derek Chisora. Style-wise, the fight's a nightmare for him. Chisora is a guy who was crashing the pocket against David Hay, heavy puncher, against Vitaly Klitschko. Right, that's who Chisora is. A fighter who's not heavily on his front foot crashing the pocket, but who's a little bit more laid back and methodical and slower. Isn't that exactly the kind of fighter who Usyk has made his Hall of Fame career against? Understand, we are talking about a former undisputed cruiserweight champion who is unbeaten today. A guy who can get up on his toes and move. A guy who could also, when necessary, be flat-footed as he was in the closing rounds of the Tony Bellew fight. Right, so this Deontay Wilder situation is perilous for a number of people. If you're Anthony Joshua and you do nothing, and Fury goes off and fights Deontay Wilder, you could find yourself getting stripped. If you fight Usyk, who knows what'll happen? You could lose your titles. Let me also say too that, you know, people's careers progress right you see a guy one year and he looks a certain way then you see the guy four or five years later and the guy's a little bit different is that the situation right now with Dylan White right everyone here knows I had Povetkin in that Dylan White rematch you know, I love underdogs who have won the first fight by stoppage, <laughs> right? I was looking at Dylan White, and I thought, you know, Dylan White's a little bit tethered to the pocket, right? Dylan White certainly was KO'd that first Prevet Kid fight. But let me tell you, as I was looking at that first Prevet Kid fight, you know, it was just interesting noticing Dylan White's power in both hands. Then you saw the second Povetkin fight, and it was pronounced. I think Joshua's a very good fighter. Joshua certainly took care of Dylan White in their first fight, although I thought White started the fight strongly, then hurt his shoulder. Right? Well, let me just say, I'm not sure if there are any guarantees in a Joshua Dillon White rematch. I know people are going to say, oh, DeWire's here hating on Anthony Joshua and stuff like that. No, far from it. This is just a recognition of who Usyk is today and of how Dillon White has firmed up his game. Right? Before you laugh at the idea of Dylan White being competitive against Anthony Joshua, and the problem Joshua is facing is he's so big in the sport. Understand, he's one of the few guys who can rival Canelo in popularity. He's so big in the sport that if he's not fighting a Fury or a Wilder, you're going to expect him you're going to demand him fight an Usyk or a White. Maybe even a slim down Andy Ruiz in what would be their third fight. 
right? So pay close attention to this Deontay Wilder situation, right? Wilder's in his 30s. It matters, right? These guys are in their 30s. They don't have the assumptions other fighters might have that they'll be at the top forever, right? The paydays matter. You have a shorter time horizon than a young star at 21 years old. All of these guys have to realize the risk involved in fighting outside fights or in taking step-aside money and watching a guy you've dropped twice already fight somebody else for a minimum of $75 million. I would not be surprised if the Fury Joshua fights fall apart and Fury is forced to fight Deontay Wilder next. Would not be surprised in the slightest. Right? Understand what that's going to do for boxing. AJ might then pivot to fight Alexander Usyk in what would be a huge fight if they get creative and if they decide hey let's make this a two fight deal then we might not get Fury against Joshua for at least the next 18 months welcome to litigation welcome to contracts welcome to boxing we've been here before waiting years for big matches that tradition sadly continues in the sport. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Tell us what you would do in the comment section of this video. You're Deontay Wilder. Let's say they get to eight figures. Let's say they say, hey, player, here's $10 million. All you have to do is sign this step aside contract. Let's say Wilder has some questions and the response is no questions asked. Right? Don't ask us if you get the winner of Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua. Don't ask us about any alleged two fight deal that those two guys might have. We're paying you this eighth figure to have a done deal. Right? No addendums. No conditions. Ten million dollars. If you're Deontay Wilder, what do you do? Tell us about it in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.